Spanky, welcome back to the Business of Betting podcast. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Australia. No matter where you are in the world, if you're looking to find your edge in sports betting or racing, you'll need to visit the Betfair Hub. From analysis to betting psychology, it has everything that you need. Simply visit betfair.com.au slash hub. Spanky, welcome back to the Business of Betting podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure being on this podcast. So some time has elapsed since we, we spoke last, and I wanted to get your take. You can take this however you like, but how do you feel as a New Jersey resident? And obviously sports betting has changed in your state, but how do you, how do you look back on the, the beginning to early stages with legal and regulated sports betting in your home state? Yeah, you know, everything is pretty much as, as gone as I expected, um, just me personally. Um, it actually went better than I expected. There's still two sports books that allow me to play, although I'm playing in reduced limits, um, FanDuel and Bet America. So um, they're, they're the only two guys. And then all the other guys um, have either chased me completely or have given me uh, limits that are just, you know, unbe- you know, just you can't uh, – the, the limits are um, – so minute, uh, you know, five dollars, ten dollars, or or a hundred dollars. It's just not 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 uh, possible for me to warrant keeping a balance there, and 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 uh, to give them any business. Um, but Bet America and FanDuel are still good. Um, FanDuel, you know, I'm I'm friendly with the guy over there, John Sharon, and he, he's a nice guy. And I think all the guys over there, um, um, and Patty Power and and and, and Betfair, you know, the the whole parent companies of these places. I think that they, you know, they let me cock my leg and, they, you know, they give me a decent pop. And I got nothing bad, th- you know, I don't have bad things to say. You know, I don't I don't bet props there. I don't, uh, I, I don't, um, you know, I don't go for the jugular. I don't attack them when they're, you know, they're off. I'm just betting meat and potatoes, side totals, money lines. You know, I give them decent NFL work and I know they appreciate that. And, you know, they give me, you know, a, a good size pop and um and everything's going well i you know with fan bet america the same way um you know I'm, I'm at half limits over there which is still fine with me um but ian over there who runs that joint uh is, is a great guy and, and i you know i, I got nothing not no bad things to say um did they both allow me to to bet and um you know, I'm I'm happy where it's at when it comes to those two joints. All the other joints, unfortunately, um, you know, not so happy. But that's to be expected. It's you know, you get used to it. Your ass gets so numb after a while, after you've been kicked out so many times that you just don't feel it anymore. Well, you you have got one of, if not the best state in the U.S. with the the regulated market, in my opinion. And I wanted to ask as well about you know your network more broadly, not necessarily you personally, as we just went through, but. What about friends and acquaintances and, and family members and, and everyone else in Jersey? Do you think generally it's been a positive for you know some people getting jobs at sports books or or having a, a good positive experience with sports betting? Yeah, you know, I know Chinese Mike has been into a couple of joints, um, and um, and they limited him as well. Um, you know, I don't really you know friends and stuff. I don't I don't I don't really. We don't really talk, you know what I mean? The guys that I know, if they're betting 50 bucks, 100 bucks, nobody's going to get limited. They're going to have a good experience. Um, but again, you know, when it comes to, to the professional market, it's just hard. Um, but I will say, you know, there's, there's, there's still licenses. You know, I live in Freehold, and, and the Freehold racetrack is here, and there's still, there's, there's, there's nobody here. And, and it's literally five minutes from my office um, and I would just love for, for a sports book to come here. I know Circa is, is from Las Vegas is planning on coming to Jersey. I know they have their site set. And, man, that would just be great because I'm very friendly with those guys. And I know that, you know, they would welcome me with open arms. Um, so, um, you know, you just hope that um, that other, you know, sports books come that, that uh, you know, that are able to take my action. You might be able to dig a little underground tunnel directly from your – living room through to uh maybe metcalf's office or Derek stevens or whoever you need over there to to get some you know action down as quickly as possible 
Yeah, I, I honestly, I could just go through the front door. I don't need to you know, do a Mission <laughs> Impossible type thing. These guys are, are always been nice to me every time. And again, I've I've only I was at the grand opening um, when they opened, and I was just there uh, about a couple of months ago, and they treated me with open arms. That they treated me very fairly. Again, I they, I haven't really given them much action. But um, I, I hope if they do come to Jersey, um, for me to give them some good action, and, and I, I would love to be able to be their customer. Um, it'll be an honor and a privilege to be able to play into a joint like that. I wanted to ask you about you. You had a, uh, I think, a five-step criteria for touts, and I definitely don't want to talk about touts at all uh, if we can avoid it. But you did have some uh, some thoughts and musings on New Jersey or, or regulated states in the U.S. in terms of what the regulators might consider as useful options to help the players out. And the first one was a, a limit sheet. And obviously, you know, it's been talked about on this show, on many other shows with a lot of smarter people than myself uh, about why sports books want to maximize their profitable segments and want to have an overall more profitable book and so on. But just take us through the world you envision with limit sheets, having a minimum and maximum bet there and, and how you think that'll be overall positive? Um, you know, I, I just think that in any in any business, um, you know, there there should be a price listed. Uh, you know, in any in especially in gambling, you go to any table game and in, in Vegas, Atlantic City, any casino, there's a min and max there. Um, of course, the maximum can always be negotiated. So a limit sheet uh, could just be, you know, it could say what the max limit is. But of course, for high rollers or VIPs, you know, otherwise known as suckers or whatever, you know, big whale players, you could always give them more than what the house limit is. But, you know, you should always be able to honor what the house limit is, no matter who comes in the door. And I just think that it's just it should be standard operation. You know, I, it's funny because the sports book industry um, is is one of the few gambling industries that doesn't have a limit sheet that doesn't tell you what your max bet is. You have to request it or you have to ask the bookmaker. Um, what other gam form of gambling? Do you know of Jake or you know that you could think of where you don't know what your max bet is just going up? There's no sign, there's no sheet that's there. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I just think that it should be standard, um, and it's not much to ask. Um, why is it not standard? You know, it's obvious because um, you know nobody wants to adhere to the limits. They want to give different limits to different people, um, and nobody wants to at least give a, a, a base. You know. Uh, limit to everybody you know they want to be able to limit you to you know five grocery dollars or ten grocery dollars and then then that's you know that's just part of the whole bookmaker dressmaker mentality yeah well i was thinking about this before with respect to card counting and i guess you know casinos may or may not have minimum or maximum bets they often do on things like roulette and, and blackjack and whatnot but when a card counter walks in then the, all the rules go out the window pretty quickly i'm guessing at least in a lot of places in a lot of scenarios and they change everything up. So I guess that's why, or that's part of the, the reason why I'm sure when, when someone comes in who's not in their profitable segment or break even or whatever they want to call it in terms of their business model, then this topic of fairness comes in and it gets very difficult and complicated pretty quickly. And I think we all realize how, how different it is depending on how we classify a professional gambler, let's say, or professional better because... The challenge is obviously it ebbs and flows and it changes by sport. It changes by different life cycles of a, a gambler's history and moving forward as well. It's, it's difficult to predict, but I guess that's where it gets complicated. And it's going to be it's going to be something that I think into the future it'll be considered just given how minimum bet laws in Australia have had impacts, certainly around this topic. They brought in a minimum bet law and uh, basically mandated those types of things and it had probably some foreseen impacts and also some unforeseen impacts in the marketplace and condensing the period of time of betting, for example, and other things. We don't need to get into that because I certainly think the Australian market is not equal to the US market, but I think it does raise the question of fairness. And I do think that's almost an impossible one to, to get a good answer on, you know, in a short period of time. But I will, you know, to, to, your, to your exactly what you said, you know, Circus Sportsbook in Las Vegas does provide a limit sheet, and um, you know they're probably one of the few that does so. So, to their credit, um, again, they, they, 
it's it's like the, they do everything right in my opinion um it's just you know i know I, I they tell me what my limits are i know what i can get down and that's that it's um and then that's you know you just want to know what your price is you walk into any establishment you want to know how much i could get down and for you to you know you know uh, i was interviewed met metcalf on on my podcast and you know it, it, you kind of they're kind of they don't put limit sheets that you want they're, they're given the subjective view of the supervisor for him to be able to make a subjective call based on how how you look like or what what he thinks he should do or what he thinks he should limit you to you know thinking you know if you know what you're doing or not and you know I mean, you're, you're giving that to a supervisor just i don't know it's you know just, just have a limit and again like you said the card counters you're gonna have a limit sheet and if you feel as if the guy is not doing you know is, is beating you then you're gonna cut him down anyway but start off with a limit sheet, um, and 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 I think that's um, you know it, it's just standard in my opinion. I think it should always be standard. So tell me about this uh, disclaimer idea with recreational betters only. Is that some form of, I guess, forcing bookmakers to be embarrassed about their business model, or forcing them to be honest, or forcing them to adhere to to certain, I guess, guidelines and principles based on how they're going to address the market they're in yeah i I think that you know um listen every bookmaker can run their business the way they want to this is america you can refuse customers that's just how it is it's 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 just part of the the of what we do that being said i think it should be known and it should be like you know there's the customer should know you're not trying to embarrass anybody but you know there used to be a website called sportsbook review it's still around but i think they took this part out I remember they used to have all these sports books listed, and some of the sports books were listed as recreational, and some of the, some of them listed as pro. And the recreational customers, you know, they didn't get—I don't think they got any less business. They just, you know, you kind of just save everybody, save time for everybody. Let's not waste each other's time. If if you don't, if you're going to kick people out, then just let people know ahead of time. You know what I mean? Somebody like me, why am I going to, you know, go through the whole process? post up the money, send you the money, do a bank wire, and then, you know, three hours later, all of a sudden, after I sent you a big uh, amount of money, I'm limited to, you know, $5.37 a game. It just, you know, we're wasting each other's time here. If you only take, you know, recreational customers, quote-unquote recreational customers, why not just say say it from the get-go? You know, places like a William Hill or anybody else, you know, it's sad because, listen, they run their business model the way they want to run it. That's fine. But let's just let, be honest. Be honest with the public. If you don't want sharp action, if you limit sharp action, if you kick sharps out, just be real. That's it. You're not going to be the. You're not the first. You're definitely not going to be the last to do so. Keep it real. If you keep it real, and again, this is something that you know maybe it's just an American thing. You just want to know what you're getting into. You kind of want to have full disclosure on everything and, and not get blindsided. I, I think that's not much to ask. The final one of the three was basically a tax break for those uh, turning over more money and, and ultimately more likely to have to lo- lower their margins in that business model. Take us through that because I think that one certainly has legs. I know it's an almighty task, certainly in a in a patchwork of states like the U.S. and obviously the federal excise tax, and that's varied over the years from I believe up into the ten percent of turnover range down to one percent, and now it's zero point two five percent, and then there's other regulatory compliance items i know there's technical compliance items not to mention the product fees that the sports uh are seeking for access to to whatever they're offering the the bookmakers as well so it's it's certainly not a frictionless system as is uh however i think it it certainly has legs it's worth considering and it's it's an idea that i think should overall if the the main message for the system is to increase volume and increase turnover i think as a starting point it, it certainly has legs yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that, you know, to, to have that variable gaming revenue tax um, based on, you know, the, 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 the uh, disclaimer, if you know, if you take pros, you sh- and if you take on all customers, you should be awarded for that. Um, and, and you're going to write more business. So if you're going to write more business, you should be tax less. And then it's not going to hurt the state because given that you're going to write more volume, even though you're taxed at a less of a percentage, um, you're still the state's still going to make uh, ample revenue. It's, it's just going to be, you know, it'll probably even make more revenue. Um, so I think that sports books, given that you know that they that they have a, a 
uh, they take on pros or if they offer a reduced juice model or anything like that, I think that the state should give back a little to maybe and, and it will help the customer um, and, and it will and it will uh, try to um, uh, entice competition so that you know everyone you know because again you you, you want what's best for your citizens. Um, while still maintaining a revenue stream for the state, and and I think that that you know this variable tax um, can achieve both goals. Yeah, the other interesting part, and you mentioned it about you know a lot of the discussions I hear around creating jobs, uh, creating business in the state, creating you know businesses coming in to rent space, buy furniture, hire employees, you know relocate into that state and have a, a vibrant business there, and then. Oftentimes, the model or the structure that they set up isn't necessarily conducive for that at all, and that causes further problems. But I think the other problem with the states sometimes is they find themselves largely accidentally in a somewhat of a prisoner's dilemma at times where, you know, if everyone could do what Montana is doing and get away with it and make a little bit of money, that would be potentially what they would do. Uh, But I think as soon as we get to a point where others are following the, the low tax rate frictionless approach type system which is incredibly hard then you will see a lot of interesting outcomes i would imagine potentially to the point where every sports better and sports betting company and sports betting person involved in tech and machine learning and innovation and so on and so forth can be in a certain state because they allow that to be positive and allow that business to flourish and thrive and it could be potentially a an uplifting thing for everyone. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's not a lot of options that fit into that bucket just yet. But hopefully, that's coming soon. Well said. I can't. I can't. I can't agree more. I wanted to ask you about horse racing. Have you ever thought about horse racing? Looked into horse racing opportunities. Some of those pools get very, very large, and there's some famous people and famous Americans who have made a lot of money over the years in Hong Kong and whatnot. Have you Have you ever looked into that area? Yeah, we tried. We didn't do too well. I had I tried to hire in-house guys to do so. We didn't do too well um, doing that. I dabbled, but I've also been paired up with a uh, with a lot of uh, with a guy, uh, you know, you know, about a decade ago, and he was phenomenal. And you know, the way you know, the way I don't know, you know, obviously in Australia it's it's, it's fixed odds, but here in America it's pari mutual. So what we um you know what we would do is i don't know what he would do you know what i mean i think he would like manipulate pools and whatnot and um and, and to be able to you know again these, these like there was like pick threes we used to bet in you know philadelphia in parks casino and parks uh philadelphia parks and, you know just a, a dollar at the window could you know fluctuate the odds and just cut them in half that's how small these pools were so you know betting the wrong side or betting the wrong horses to be able to inflate these pools and you bet them offshore where you know the offshore places will pay either full track odds or might be able to pay um you know on a, odds up to a certain amount um then and, and this is how we were able to exploit that for 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 a little bit in a few years and we did a pretty good job at it i was paired with a really good horse handicapper um but um, we haven't dabbled much, um, not too much recent times, but it's always something that's in the back of my mind if I uh, ever run to somebody that's uh, comp- you know, Our plates are so full as it is, but um, we're always thinking about ways to, you know, to increase our earns. Do you have a sense of what was most difficult about it? Do you, do, any memories or thoughts that stand out as to why horse racing might have been tough? Was it just the, the structure of the market, the, the way horse racing is set up? From a betting perspective, yeah, you know all these sports books. Every sports book would have a set, would have a different rule. You know, the hardest part was being able to make sure that we were going to get paid, you know, or maximize our earn. You know, some people would say, "Listen, we're going to pay fifty to one max, no matter what happens." Other places will say, "No, we're going to pay five thousand dollars max." So then you'd have to try to calculate, you know, exactly what the worst odds are going to be to be able to not bet more than what you're supposed to. You know what I mean? So, so that, that's that was the whole thing on trying to just design and, and spread the bets out enough to make sure that every sports book was going to give you full pay. You know, the, the last thing you ever want is for them to cap you. You know, when you're supposed to get paid, you know, ten thousand five hundred dollars, and they have a five thousand dollar limit. You know, you get ripped off fifty five hundred, um, a five thousand dollar win limit. So, you, you know, you have to be able to. That was the hardest thing to be able to just spread it out enough to um with all these offshore sports books to be able to maximize um and not leave any money on the table i should say well hopefully there's some fixed odds betting coming shortly to 
the US market, uh, New Jersey and everywhere else pretty generally so we can have a bit more fun with it because a lot of those pools are tough and even you know when Saratoga comes around even some of the Triple Crown and some of the more well-known tracks don't necessarily have a vibrant betting landscape which is a bit of a shame but who knows yeah I, I you know listen you know Pinnacle's taken horse betting uh you know you know decades you know over a decade ago for a reason you know the, the, I know the horse guys they're probably, you know, they make us sports guys look like nothing. You know, when, when, some of these horse guys, they're unbelievable, and and, and they're, they're the best in the world. You know, they, they maximize their earn to a, to a, to a level that you know is, is just unfathomable. I, I you know, I'm happy earning one, two, three percent ROI. These guys are are just printing money. So, um, you know, I, if that fixed odds thing comes, it's it's going to be a monster, uh, and then. There's going to be a lot of, you know, sports or, or anything. There's going to be a lot of people going into that, um, to just switching off and um, and finding ways. Because if you get a locked price in on some of these horse on some of these horses, um, you know, there's a lot a lot of smart people that, that know a lot about horses. And uh, you know, I, I hope it lasts. I don't know how long it will last, but man, it's uh, it's 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 definitely dangerous waters uh, for for anybody booking that stuff. Those greedy horse players, huh? Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's, <laughs> it's unbelievable how sharp they are. So tell me where your competition comes from. And what I mean is what allows you and makes you and the team innovate and get better and get faster and stronger as a business. And what's, you know, what's in your rear view mirror? Is it other betters? Is it the marketplace generally? Is it uh, necessity? Is it internal drive to be on the cutting edge? Tell me what, what drives you along. Um, competition, you know, again, I'm not, I don't really, you know, it's, 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 everything is, is technology. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, just during this whole pandemic, you know, I'm fine tuning my software. I'm, I'm fine tuning my auto betters, fine tuning my alert systems to be able again, you know, if I, a second, just, a, just having things a second faster, you know, could be the difference between, you know, getting the price and not getting a price. So it, it just, you know, everything is based on speed. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not really interested in our, or thinking about any competition. I think that, you know, again, not to try to toot my own horn, but I, I do believe we're in a league of our own. Um, but that being said, we don't like to rest on our laurels. Um, we like to do the best we can. And, um, and you know, listen, I, I, I feel as if we got the fastest car on the track, but um, but I, you know, what does it matter if I can't get down? And and that's always the hardest thing, um, in, in our business is to be able to get down, to be able to find places that'll book our action. Because I can have the sharpest plays in the world. I could be able to get down at the best prices, uh, or, or or anticipate the price movements and line movements. But if there's nobody there to book my bets, what does it matter? So that's always the biggest thing to try to be able to find places. And it's just, you know, it's a cat and mouse game where you just try to find places to book your action. Um, and that's why I rely on betting partners to be able to provide these these outs for me because, you know, it's impossible for somebody like me or Chinese Mike or anybody to, to go through the front door uh, of, of many places and, 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 and for them to just say, yeah, come on in. So um, that's always going to be the constant struggle. How do you balance educating the the public audience through your podcast for example through interviews like this or i uh i saw you on vsin as well those types of interviews can get pretty broad and those aspiring sports betters out there who are looking for ways to improve and get better listen to you and then take i'm sure notes and then try and improve that way how do you balance that with with needing to have these partnerships and try and access as many different uh, outs as possible because obviously there's there's a trade-off when it comes to those two things yeah absolutely you know listen I, I i do the i do my podcast and i try to educate because you know there was a time in which i knew nothing and and, and how did i get my education uh i i went on betting forums and sports betting forums back in the day were, were you know, a lot of the pros a lot of guys shared so much knowledge and without that knowledge I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. So, you know, I, I it's part of me wants to give back and you're right. You know, there's a lot of things I keep close to my chest, but at the same time, you know, again, I, I, you know, I, I'm an open book when it comes to stuff. I, you know, everybody knows like, you know, we're, we're, we don't handicappers. Everything's based on technology. We're trying to get the best price. 
Um, and and listen, if somebody can can try to you know if maybe if I'm training tomorrow's competitor, then so be it. You know what I mean? You know we're on we're we're competition kind of makes us stronger. We're not afraid of 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 having competition or not afraid of somebody trying to beat us to prices. Um, you know we feel as if we're always going to have the upper hand and and the information network that I've developed over the years and then the technologies. You know, again, we believe we're second to none. So, um, but you're right; it is it is a tough thing. But I enjoy it. I feel, I you know, I, I feel it makes me feel good to be able to share some insight. And you know, guys that are you know, I never thought of things like that. People tell me I never thought of it that way, or that's a good point you made. You know, this is because this is how I felt when people told me things, and and people uh, took me under their wing and, and, and taught me things when I was coming up in the business. So it's great to share knowledge. Um, and um, you know, listen, God's blessed me. This business has been so good to me, um, and, and I've, I've, I'm able to support my family doing this. And um, I, I, I'm so thankful that it's not bad to give back. You know, absolutely. And you know, we don't get taught how to do our tax returns at high school or at university, and we don't get taught how to bet sports either. But if you were given the title and the mantle of the professor of sports betting, at any university, let's call it University USA. What are you adding to the curriculum? What's something that the the those at universities, for example, need to learn about sports betting, whether they are uh, complete fish altogether and they've never even heard about or talked about sports betting, or those that come with some uh, some experience of their own and maybe looking for a higher level of learning. Does anything spring to mind? I know you've talked about a lot of different things over the last couple of years, especially. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think a support, you know, given to see what, what the Montana and all these other states are doing, just a basic sports betting one on one on on bookmakers whole percentage, and 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 these things that just you know these regulators in so many places just don't understand, and and you know for, for them to have that wide of a straddle, and for and for them to think that this is okay. Um, they just don't understand the origins of the business, the history of the business. And I, I, it's crazy how seeing something like that can go to market and for, for you know, for people to say, yeah, that's OK. Like it, it's passed through so many eyes and, and, and nobody has said anything. You know, the, I think th there's people, you know. The United States, unfortunately, you know, they think that sports betting is a lot of these regulators or, or people that are enacting these laws or, or these bills. Um, they think that, that you know, the, the sports betting is new. You know, this is ingrained in our culture for for centuries. Uh, you know, this is gambling is just in, it's just been around for so long, and particularly sports betting for decades and decades. You know, from New York to Pittsburgh to L.A. to Vegas to Chicago. You know, this is just part of what we do just because you know there's now regulated sports books doesn't mean that you know not every single person prior to 2018 um you know most of the guys that are betting today most of the guys had a local bookie that's just part of it every barber was a bookie every candy store owner was a bookie every you know it's just part of the culture and i think that there's so many local experts and 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 guys that could provide value and provide insight and I think that's getting overlooked, unfortunately. I, I just can't believe how some of these things gets passed and, 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 and is deemed okay and acceptable given how much local talent that we have. Um, it, it's just it's, it's unbelievable. I, I just can't. I'm shocked to see, you know, minus 32 on both sides. It's just unbelievable how something like that can go through. Yeah, it really is. And I wanted to ask you about that because like you said, there is a, a rich history here in the US and I don't think it's necessarily something that's well known outside of the US or I might be surprised, but oftentimes when the US is discussed or talked about just generally, certainly in some of the circles I talk about it, the starting point is brand new market, brand new place to, to have sports betting. But the reality is places like Jersey and Philly and Chicago and Pittsburgh uh, certainly when it comes to things like football and an NBA, especially college sports, there's a wealth of knowledge right there. And whether it is at the barbershop, uh, and hopefully a lot of those barbers are able to stay in business for, for those who need haircuts, but it sounds like for those who, who need other things, is it something that, or how do we convert that history, that origin of sports betting from those people, as well as those offshore, to help, I guess, augment what we're going through here in the U.S.? 
Well, you don't even have to go to to the to the you know to your local barbershop bookmakers. You could just look at Las Vegas, who's run a successful sports you know bookmaking model for decades. Just you know, there's so many experts in Las Vegas, yet they get overlooked. Like, like you know. If, how can some of these states deal minus 32 both sides? You know, just look at Vegas, emulate Vegas. You know, the Vegas minus 110 both ways. This is this is standard. This is what we've known. And it's just insulting. And, and it's a slap in the face. You know, I don't know Montana. You know, I don't know anybody, you know, there's a, in Montana. But, how, you know, I'm, like, how, how can somebody like what do you like it's an insult to the residents um and it's an insult to the industry it's just it's it's disgusting to see that um you know you have to be able to trust you have to um, the first thing i think is you have to eliminate the taboo of somebody that you know wasn't a legal bookmaker or somebody that worked off offshore you know this taboo is over now that's it you know what i mean that's like saying oh man you know you used to smoke marijuana but now that it's legal it's okay you know what i mean that's it. who these taboos should be eliminated being a bookmaker should be – even if you were an illegal bookmaker or worked for an illegal bookmaker and if you did your time or if you paid your price or if it was you know, several decades ago, who cares? This is knowledge that they have. So many of these guys can run some of these joints very successful and, and, and they bring a knowledge that is just it, – it, it's – and, and there's no comparison to what they know. And, and it's so much local talent and so much talent in places like Costa Rica that I just, I, I you know, it, it's, it's, it's like, like, come on, you know, you can't turn a blind eye and say, oh, no, this is a new market and we just want to bring in, you know, Europeans that have, that have booked, um, that have, you know, that are in the, you know, legal bookmaking markets in Europe. No, the, bo- Europe bookmakers is a different than American bookmaker it's just completely different um, you know they're, they're, you know not just the sports but just how people think and, how, and and I'm not trying to insult anything in Europe listen some of the best bookmakers are in Europe but it's just different sports you know uh, w- one of my guests on my podcast Pat Parada I think he was telling me that some of these softwares you know they they, uh, they give you the, the same limits on a second half and, and a first quarter um, NBA total or something like that so you know th- their software doesn't allow them to change those limits where you know what I mean you're kind of tied down because you want to take a big number on a second half total but again you don't want to get killed on a first quarter total so the software doesn't allow them to change these things and 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 again booking US sports you can't just you know try to squeeze a circle into a square you have to be able to know and the software should be designed in my opinion should be designed American based software guys that know how to book US sports to accommodate US sports and then if you want to bring in sports like soccer or, 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 or cricket or anything like that, that's when if you want to maybe make changes and because and, and, you know what, the type of business you're going to write on that compared to in the U.S., compared to the NBA, the NFL, the college football is, is minuscule. So you want to be able to just make sure that that the major sports are covered and stretch out into the other sports where in Europe, you know, these these major sports that we have here, they're considered minor sports so it's just it's just a different different uh, um structure that should be set i think it would be incredible to see what a talent pool like you're describing all having a crack at it as we say uh in a place like new jersey would look like you know if you had derek stevens and, and metcalf and the crew come to to hoboken or jersey city or wherever they would land uh, or freehold and you had i even remember listening to i think it was uh richie was his name you Rich, interviewed? Yeah, Richie, yeah, Richie Bocciolari, one of the greatest. He was talking about some of the things that he has been through and some of the different aspects that were important to him. And I found it interesting because I didn't know enough about the, uh, you know, the previous history in Vegas, and he'd spent plenty of time there. I'd love to see some of those types of people, you know, try their their hand at multiple states at once, and and whatever their area of passion is, whether it's technology, whether it's bookmaking, whether it's high volume bookmaking, whether it's whatever it is. Uh, and see how everyone would go, including those that have spent time in other parts of the world doing it, whether it is Europe, whether it is, you know, wherever it is, it doesn't really matter. You know, we've seen points bet have a crack at the uh, US market as well. The Aussies being represented in many, you know, shapes and sizes with what they're doing. So I think that's where, wouldn't it just be amazing to see that, you know, in any state or any place where everyone can try their model, try their business, try their best and, and see who's, who's able to, to take the market share. 
I love that. And it's crazy because in the United States, there is not, you know, other than, you know, one isolated location or two locations, you know, there are no U.S. bred bookmakers spread across the country. Everything is international. Everything is European or Australian. So it's just, you know. Let, let give a U.S. bookmaker a chance. Let a U.S. bookmaker that has been trained here, that knows that that, that has come up, you know, in homebred, and let's see how they do. Because no, they're not just just you want to see them get a chance. You want, and that's what I'd like to see. And again, it's not just a patriotic thing; it's just that mental, mentally wise, you know, they think like us. They understand what U.S. customers want. You know, you know, for software to be able to limit somebody to five dollars and thirty-two cents, this to me, I don't in sharp or square, it doesn't matter. How that happens is unfathomable. How, when I was betting at DraftKings, how when I would bet, you know, and my limit was. One thousand one hundred forty-seven dollars and sixty-seven cents, and they would give me coins back. Like this type of shit. That's, <laughs> how, how does this happen? How does this happen? It, it just. How does this get through? How does this pass? And how do people think this is okay? It just. I, I just. I can't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, so you know. I. I. I again. I, I. I think that that we'd love to see, like you said, Jake, to see. Um, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, homebred bookmakers get a chance. Yeah, and I do think there is a, a large group of those coming through. A lot of them are starting out from the base level and building their own tech and building their own business model and building their own approach for a U.S. product, for a U.S. market. I think it'll just take time. It's certainly something that does take time because there are so many components that go into building a sports book, let alone a successful sports book. And I know some of the hurdles that exist, not only technical, not only regulatory and licensing and all the legal challenges that go into making sure you're compliant, but not only that, then there's market access challenges as well. So I think even some of the states we've seen now with, you mentioned Montana, we talked about that. We've seen, I think New Hampshire as well has a monopoly. Uh, there's some other states that make it difficult to get access and enter the market, even if you want to. And there's others that, that like, you know, follow the New Jersey style and, Colorado is one that started, I think, this month um, to try and see what they can do with multiple operators. But I think it's coming. It'll just take some time, but it'll be cool to see what that looks like and some of the, the thoughts and thinking coming to life in the U.S. And it'll be great to, to be around to see that evolve over the next couple of decades. I love it. I love it. I can't wait. I can't wait. And that's, again, I'm not holding my breath. Don't get me wrong. You know, for me, offshore will always still be king. And then, well, you know, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a professional sports better that just bets, you know, in, in, in the U.S. that just bets domestically. It just can't. The appetite is just not enough. There's not enough to, to fulfill that appetite. Um, you know, Asia and, and the offshore is required to, to make any professional outfit sustainable. That being said, I hope that one day changes. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, if I ever wanted to hand this business off to my son or, you know, I wouldn't want him dealing with some of the offshore characters I deal with. I don't want him to be able to deal completely domestically with all regulated sports books. And I wouldn't want him because, you know, if he had to deal with some of the guys I deal with, he'd probably get swallowed whole. You know what I mean? So it's just I'd want I'd, I'd want everything to be domestic. And I hope one day um, it, it could happen. Yeah, I think the ingredients are there as well. It's just a matter of someone to put them all together into the the perfect American meal, whether that's a happy meal or whether that's something else we'll see. But just finally, I, I wanted to ask you about your podcast and what you might have picked up, what you've learned, why you are doing it. I think you know people have different reasons for doing their own podcast, so I'm interested in hearing yours. Yeah, you know, it was an itch I wanted to scratch. Um, you know, I asked my buddy Rufus, and, and I go, you know, why do you do yours? And he goes, I don't know. I just, you know, just something to talk about, and you know, there's no sponsorships, there's nothing like that. So I just said, you know what? Let me just talk and then see if if it picks up any traction. And then, you know, I, I kind of, you know, when I talk by myself on, on my podcast, it just doesn't really excite me because I, I can't, you know, talking to myself is just, you know, that's not something, you know, maybe in the shower I might do that. But, you know, looking at a screen, talking to myself and trying to make points just feels a little weird. So I kind of, you know, interview people just like you do, Jake. And um, I kind of want to get different perspectives on guys that I respect in the business and the industry. And I've, I've loved it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in everybody I speak to. And then. And I get a lot out of it. 
it, and I think I, I ask you know good questions, and I think I, I could bring a unique perspective as a pro sports better to be able to ask some questions that not maybe not many people would think about, and to be able to bring some you know some bookmakers that not too many people would know, you know, not just the legal, you know, Nevada or, or U.S. Uh, bookmakers, but also some guys that, you know, that, that have that have booked on the streets of New York City back in the 70s and 80s. And then, and to bring in that, that, that uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, point of view. So this is something, you know, I enjoy doing and, and it's something that, you know, just to be able to, t you know, have a friendly conversation with once every week or two, um, you know, it, you know, you can't go wrong. Right? You know, the whole editing part and that stuff that's a pain in my ass you know i kind of you know i'm not a big <laughs> fan of that and all that other shit you know what i mean if, especially when i'm talking like my buddy tugboat you know i had to do a lot of editing on that he started mentioning a few too many names and you know we kind of <laughs> we kind of talked you can't mention guys that are still alive only guys that have passed so you know but you know for the most part you know what i mean it's um it's been definitely a great experience and, and a fun time and uh you know i, I uh you know i i, I I enjoy doing it, and you know, and if, and if the audience enjoys it, I enjoy it. Then um, maybe you know, guys can learn hearing um, from some of these experts that I'm talking to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing you'll find, I'm sure, is when your son does take over the enterprise and, and looks back in time and has the ability to listen into some of those, you know, years later. I think that'll be awesome and fun for him as well. And just final question for you on the podcast. Who's the the guest that you would love to have on that you haven't or you won't be able to have on or maybe the dream guest? It doesn't necessarily need to be a betting guest. It might be, you know, Mike Tyson or someone like that. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of guys. You know, you you had Marco Bloom on and he was great. And I've listened to both podcasts that you had him on. I respect all those pinnacle guys greatly. There's a lot. Listen, there's so many guys in the business, and 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 it's hard because guys, I can't even mention their names. The guys that I would want to come on, um, some of the dream guests of mine, because again, they're still in operation and they operate illegally uh, offshore. So, um, but these are some of the best guys in the world. They're great guys. They just can't really speak publicly about what they do. That being said, um, you know, I, I I you know I don't really you know it's not about dream guests and whatever. I I. I I, I enjoy it, and I and I think that um, it, you know, just to, I I love bringing a side of the business that not too many people see, um, and um, I'll continue doing so. So I, I think it's something that you know I look forward to doing every every so often. Yeah, it's very unique as well. So there's a lot of valuable insights that you you simply cannot find anywhere else. So I think that's great. Keep it up. Thanks for coming on again. It's great to chat with you always, and. Uh, you know, we'll do this down the road again, but keep doing your episodes, keep pumping them out, and then hopefully we get back to uh, normal life here soon, normal betting here soon, and, and everyone will be happier then. Absolutely, and thanks for that compliment, Jake. That means a lot coming from you, that you you know you think the podcast is unique and everything, because in my opinion, you're one of the best of the best in this podcast business. Um, you bring out the best in all your guests, and your guests are unbelievable, and you ask some great questions, and I think uh, you know, lots of credit to you for, for what you do in, in this business and, and, and on your podcast. It's, obvious, it's one of the best podcasts out there, so for you to compliment mine is, is such an honor. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it.